Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us here Nationwide at 5. I'm Cliff Hughes. And I'm Siobhan Campbell. Good afternoon, Siobhan. Good afternoon, Sir Hughes. Good. Well, in our cover story this afternoon, the country's economy grew by just under 2% for the January to March quarter of 2024 compared to the corresponding period last year. That's according to the latest data by the Planning Institute of Jamaica, the PIOJ. It's the 12th consecutive quarter of economic gain since Jamaica's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. That's according to the Institute's Senior Director of Economic Planning, James Stewart. Today, we are reporting that real gross domestic product for the Jamaican economy grew by an estimated 1.9% in the January to March 2024 quarter compared with the corresponding quarter of 2023. This represents 12 consecutive quarters of growth. The performance for the January to March 2024 quarter largely reflected the impact of 1. Increased external demand, which was facilitated by continued growth in the economies of Jamaica's main trading partners. That's James Stewart. He's the Senior Director of Economic and Planning at the PIOJ. Well, growth for the quarter was recorded in both the goods producing and services industries. The mining and quarrying industry was the standout performer on the goods producing side. It grew by nearly 25%. This was followed by agriculture, which improved by nearly 8%, and manufacturing, which also grew by 2%. However, construction declined by 4.5%. On the services side, electricity and water supply led the way, with growth of 6.7%. That was followed by tourism, which advanced by 6.3%. All other sectors under services grew between 1.5 and 0.3 percent. The Planning Institute is projecting continued growth in the next quarter for this fiscal year. Well, joining us to discuss further is the president of the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association, Sydney Thwaites, economist Dr. Adrian Stokes, and managing director for Selagin Limited, Devon Sterling. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 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 Uh, let's start with you, Dr. Stokes. While 2% is uh, mm -hmm. something that we can all be thankful for, growth is growth, we seem to be constrained in terms of our growth numbers. Outside of that, uh, the post-pandemic boom, so to speak, when we were just recovering, we don't seem to be able to break out of the single digits or even get into, say, the 7%. Why? Yes. Um, I, I think first we, we need to acknowledge the continued growth in the economy. We should not take that for granted, right? So that's a good thing. The issue that you mentioned is a long-standing one with the Jamaican economy, and a number of structural factors account for that. The one that we can discuss and perhaps many persons will be most familiar with is the our relatively low productivity right, um, in, in the economy, especially labor productivity. So we have to come to grips with uh, training and overall education, especially um, for our young people. And we, we have to do other things in terms of improving things like our infrastructure, uh, be better connectivity among industries, and, and, and so on. But, but primarily, um, the, the one that we can highlight um, has to do with the, the, the low productivity, and in, in particular, labor productivity. That's one of the significant constraints to, to overall growth. The, the other thing to, to look at is, is, is also new industries. We, we have to create industries that add um, greater value, right? One of the things that we are, we are currently um, working through as an economy is that if you look, for example, at the BPO sector, it has employed a number of young persons, and that's a really, really good thing. To, to get to the levels of growth um, that other um, developing economies uh, have seen, for example, 5 6 7%, we now need to move to a higher value within that sector. And, and that's something that you will um, or you can do if you have, um, you know, more skilled persons are persons who are trained at a much higher level compared to what we have today. Uh, Dr. Stokes, I'm wondering, is this a regional curse, though? Because if you read the reports from pretty much every other Caribbean country outside of Ghana, which has, 
essentially won the geographical lottery, there seems to be the same problem, anemic growth. Right. DOMREP has shown that you can grow your economy at fairly decent levels. Uh, but you are correct that many of our Caribbean neighbors are afflicted with this low growth um, issue, largely because, you know, they are, uh, you know, involved in the, in the production or certain services that are commoditized, for want of a better term. In other words, the, the, the purchasing or the pricing power uh, isn't that sign- significant on when you talk about uh, at a globally competitive scale. And, and, and therefore, the value of, of the output, uh, you know, faces that intense competition, and it drives down the overall value. Certainly, retention of value in the economy is also a big factor, and that speaks to how well you can improve the, um, you know, connectedness among um, industries. Um, tourism, for example, is, is, is a big one, right? The, the ability to earn more from each dollar that is spent abroad in the, the, the actual economy, the domestic economy, if you understand the business model for, for that industry, um, you will see that, that one, of the, one of the ways to, to drive greater value is to produce more outputs or supply more um, services and goods um, from the local economy. Let um, me bring... Too, too much import um, within that overall um, business segment. All right, let me bring in here the president of the Manufacturers and Exporters Association, Sydney Thwaites. Your sector, Mr. Thwaites, manufacturing, recovered somewhat because it registered 2% as against 3.8% uh, in the first quarter of 2023, which fell to 03 in the last quarter of the year. What's happening? Is manufacturing about to rebound and rebound strongly or what? Um, I, I think it depends on other factors. Um, obviously, the growth um, is good and the consistent growth is good, um, but we really need to grow our manufacturing at a, at a higher rate um, than we have. Um, and I think we have to keep in mind that the growth has come in a time um, in which the high interest rates and the limited access to capital has hindered growth. So those are the policies that would have gotten in the way of the growth, and we had a little bit of growth nonetheless. Um, but it's certainly not, not, um, it's certainly not enough. Mm-hmm. And Devon Sterling, Selogen, you're an engineering and real estate development company. Construction, yes? Fallen again, minus 4.5%. What's happening to construction? Is a boom over? Um, that might very well be so because um, in, in, in my field, what I have to do is always be looking at what are the indicatives, you know, look at viability of projects that we want to roll out. And if I, if I take it back to the basics and look at the general motives for construction, you know, it falls into three categories. There is uh, residential development, um, you know, for affordable housing, high end housing, uh, single housing starts. There are commercial developments that are in support of, for example, the BPO spaces, you know, general office spaces, and, and for expansions in manufacturing. And there are the government projects, the capital um, projects for infrastructure. And when I look at each of those three broad categories, I can see where we're coming from, somewhat of a, of a of a high point in this past to the mm-hmm. current situation. In capital projects, there have been several ongoing uh, government projects that have been very large, and they are now in their completion and winding down phases. And major projects uh, are just now building steam, so I don't think that they would have, you know, have any uh, impact on the current analysis that has been presented. If you look in commercial developments, and uh, we find that there is a lot of working from home, and so there isn't as strong a need for, for general office spaces, and this is not anything new. Mm. But in terms of growth in the commercial space to support BPOs, for example, what you're seeing instead is a conversion of existing spaces from office spaces and other uses into BPOs, and a lot of the sectors uh, is, is, um, is doing work from home. Mm-hmm. In terms of expansion in manufacturing, you know, we're, we're waiting on that sector to continue to grow before that will trickle down, you know, as far as to start to get more bullish with the industry and decide to put in more infrastructure and, and actual physical uh, spaces. Mm-hmm. 
But I think where the biggest effect has happened is that when you look at residential development, what we're seeing now is a softening in particular in the high-end housing. You know, and the, the, the reasons for, for high-end housing usually was for uh, Airbnb, you know, their personal homes and, and, and for high-end rentals. And what you found is that that market has softened now where there isn't that high a demand because in this um, past, there have been a lot of players that have entered in the market and have basically attacked that high end because of the, the super profits and the shorter turnaround times that you have. And now I believe that that has been mopped up. Mm-hmm. So there is, there is great demand still in the affordable housing space. And, and even as that is so, there are very high barriers to entry that still exist. Mm-hmm. so that it is hard to keep up and get into the affordable housing space because that is what I consider a long game. Mm-hmm. You have to be at it for a longer time, and the barriers to entry are much higher because those have to be done at large scales to be successful. Mm-hmm. I still believe, however, that the single housing starts remain hot as all they are. So the aggregate of all of these movements is that what we're seeing in the construction um, aspect is a general downturn in, in the numbers. From where it was in, All right, hold, you know, it there. hold it there first, gentlemen. We're up on our first break. The economy grew by 1.9% over the last quarter. That's January to March. And there are still expectations for further growth in the 1% to 2% range over the next quarter and for the fiscal year. We have with us uh, Managing Director for Selgin Limited, Devon Sterling, economist Dr. Adrian Stokes, and President of the Jamaica Manufacturers Association, Sidney Thwaites. Uh, uh, Mr. Sterling, there was something that you said that stuck out to me regarding the not as much demand for, say, BPO spaces and other such large-scale construction projects. Then I wonder, what led the growth during the COVID period? Because during that time, construction really stood out in terms of getting projects up I believe it was at up almost 7% during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, so much so that the Prime Minister put in special measures to further enhance growth for the construction sector during that period. What is the difference then and now? Well, I think the primary difference, you know, is, and I don't want to sound speaking of in banking, is, is, the, is the fact that I believe that there was a lot of liquidity back then. Um, I think what drove the whole thing was really um, the, the activity that took place in the high, middle to high end um, housing um, starts. Because there, there was a lot of activities. There were several, you know, new codes um, that have been created and a lot of persons that were going at that piece at the time. There were also, and there still are also, a lot of affordable housing, which is still a mainstay of construction, which which is going to be, in my opinion, um, a sector that, that will continue to be active regardless of the state of the economy. So what we had happening then, and it was a surprise for us as well, too, because we believe that COVID would have caused a slowdown, but the demand for those kind of units at that time was still very, very high. And, you know, the, the, the construction field is a result of what the what aggregate demand is. And so I was... I was not so surprised that the construction level would have been high because the demand remained high. But I am seeing now, with when we check on our reports from from colleagues in the in the realtor space, you find that a lot of the higher end units now are spending way more days on the market now than they used to before. You know, it, what we found was that there were a lot of persons who were buying into several um, several different schemes. They are the same. Uh, customers coming in and buying different units for the, the for for reasons of rentals and so on, and also we believe it was to convert liquidity into real assets, which would be a safe place, you know, in my opinion, to to put your money. So I believe that a lot of that has been mopped up now, and what we are faced with now is what we would consider now the the, the regular demand from persons who are not as moneyed as before. Mm-hmm. Adrian Stokes. Mining and quarrying up almost 25% on the back of almost 22% in the October to to December quarter last year. Coming down from 164% in the April to June quarter of last year, following 114% in the January to March quarter. Explain 
what's happening there? Yeah, I, I think it really in that sector has a lot to do with capacity utilization, right? And the significant growth that you saw in January to March of 23 was due to a um, significant recovery in the sector, right? Um, and then what you're seeing now is more of a ramping up. So if you look at the October to December number relative to the January to March number, the quarter over quarter, uh, they are fairly similar, um, 22%, then, then going to 25%, representing an increase in utilization. So that would be the major uh, reason explaining the, the, the growth in mining and quarries. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Stokes, as well as Sydney Thwaites, with you first, Dr. Stokes, does it seem that Jamaica remains primarily focused on what I would consider extractive industries because our growth numbers are almost entirely dictated by tourism, where agriculture is trending, whether it be up or down, and mining and quarrying? How do we now transfer? for that or transform that rather towards where we should be going in terms of manufacturing and value added production right so, so that's that's one of the points i was making earlier as it relates to low economic growth so that we are primarily uh, engaged in industries that have very little pricing power on the international market so we definitely need to improve a number of things, including our, our overall productivity. The stability of the economy is also a major factor, right? Uh, and we have uh, a stable footing, which is something that we have not had always in this economy. We have significant amount of macroeconomic stability, which gives us the platform to build on in terms of uh, investing in key areas. in in the economy. So the strategy really has to be to invest in our people, improve the infrastructure, uh, improve or make it easier to to do business uh, in Jamaica. And, you know, I think we're on the right path. The debt to GDP um, will be down below 70% come next year. No, that's massive. That's going to crowd in the, the private sector and will be a catalyst for um, foreign investment and also look at local capital to take risk. Because that's what happens, that for you to get the type of growth that the economy needs to move forward, you need risk-taking, prudent risk-taking activity. And with the debt levels falling and the risk-free rate in Jamaica falling significantly, to make money in Jamaica, you're going to have to take prudent risk. And, and that's a good thing. So I think as long as we continue to, to have the, the macroeconomic stability, we will have the, the basis for risk-taking activities that will drive the growth going forward. And of course, we must invest in our people. And Sydney, mm-hmm. Thwaites, the impact on the output of manufacturing and exporters with the interest rates you're all having to endure now, how is that working? Um, I would tell you that our larger manufacturers are are investing in expansion, in acquisition, in automation, um, and are doing the right things to to increase their competitiveness um, internationally. Um, the concern I have is that um, the gap in between our larger manufacturers and our medium-sized and small manufacturers is widening, um, and that's primarily due to access to capital. So if we really want to see the growth um, throughout our sector, we really need to find um, a way to give our smaller and medium-sized manufacturers access to capital at competitive rates. Um, and, and I believe we would see a significant increase in, um, in our growth if that was the case. Mm-hmm. And what would you consider the significant inhibitor in terms of access to that capital currently? Um, well, we're, we're, we're in a period of high interest rates, and that doesn't help. But um, uh, I think if we look at a market like Adamarep um, that has been able to achieve um, the higher rates of growth, uh, their banking sector um, is, is, is a lot more aggressive and, and, and competitive um, in their practices of lending. Um, so smaller companies and startup companies have much more access 
to capital um, than what we have here. So, so um, I think we need we need to work through that because I think that's what's going to unlock a bit of growth that we haven't haven't unlocked up to now. Okay, thank you very much. Sydney Fates is the president of the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association. Dr. Adrian Stokes, economist and managing director of Siloge and Limited, Devon Sterling. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us inside our cover story.